All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of TDX. Thanks uh, for getting up early with us. Thanks for coming back on day two. We're glad to see you all. A quick note before we begin, um, please make any purchasing decisions based on currently available products. You guys know the drill. All right, so I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Justin Piehowski. I'm a lead evangelist with Salesforce Architects. I'm here with two of my peers. I am Nevia Van Wright, Principal Evangelist of Salesforce Architects. Good morning. And I am Shobi Abdi, also Principal Evangelist, Salesforce Architects. All right. And guess what we're going to talk about today? AI. Maybe you've heard a little bit about it in the last 48 hours. Um, so as you know, Salesforce has been working on AI since about 2014. We see ourselves going into the second wave of AI, the generative AI wave. This is a big deal. Good news for you, we're not going to get into any more details or features or launch any new products on this stage today. Today we're going to talk about how this impacts you as an architect. And I know that as you get on the plane and go home and start to think about AI in your organization, it can be very overwhelming. What do I do with all this information? Where do I start? I've got good news for you. We've actually had a framework in place for several years at Salesforce that helps architects like you take all of this information and we can provide standards for designing and implementing healthy Salesforce solutions. We work with our product team, we work with engineers, we work with our third party consultants, all on how the Salesforce platform is working and we build it into this framework that we've made available for you. We see a well-architected Salesforce solution having three components. The first is trust. The second is that it's easy for your end users to use. And the third is that it's adaptable to the changing nature of business and life and technology. The fantastic news for you is that this applies just as well to AI in Salesforce as it did to all previous Salesforce solutions. So we're going to go through each of these three areas of uh, our well-architected framework and apply them to AI and how you can use them in your organizations. Let's start with the most important piece of the well-architected framework, trust. Trusted AI protects business and stakeholders, pure and simple. If you don't have trust with your, st with your stakeholders, you have nothing. We see three elements of trusted AI solutions um, within Salesforce. The first is that it's secure. You can control and protect your data. The second is that it's reliable. It operates efficiently and dependently. And third, and I feel this one is very important, it's compliant. It follows legal and ethical guidelines. This third one here is only going to get more important as we go into the world of AI. So if you've read the Salesforce Well-Architected website, um, you'll know that we talk a lot about patterns and anti-patterns. So a pattern is basically something you want to follow. It's guidance that can help you get closer to a well-architected solution. So I want to talk a little bit about patterns that you'll see when you are trying to build trusted AI. The first place you want to look is in your data. You should treat your data with the utmost care and respect when you are working in the world of AI. The safety, sensitivity, and ultimately power of your AI relies on well-organized and well-classified data. Yes. The second place you should look uh, in your organization when trying to build trusted AI is in your design standard. Transparency leads to trust. Your standards, so the standards that your designers and developers follow, should always reference the data that is coming in to generate these responses. Identify it. Remember that annoying professor in college that made you do the bibliography at the end of the paper? Same thing, cite your sources, build trust. Uh, and the last part of the pattern is look to your business process. Internally, you need to have regular checks in place to see how the AI is doing, to check for errors, to make sure that it's getting better. AI is not set it and forget it. I'm going to say that again. Your AI cannot be set it and forget it. You have to constantly be checking in with performance, how it's doing, and making sure that it's staying safe and getting better. 
On the other side of patterns, we have anti-patterns. So put simply, anti-patterns are just things that you want to avoid when building trusted AI, or if you see any of these in your current AI solutions, you should raise your hand and start talking. Um, the first place to look for an anti-pattern would be in your documentation. Your AI should be grounded in purpose, in your business's purpose, in your organization's purpose. We're not building AI just because it's cool, it's fun. That's a bad idea. You are making your business better. You should absolutely see your company's values reflected in your documentation around building AI. We're going to come back to design standards for anti-patterns. Um, if a design standard fails to identify AI, where it's coming from, what kind of data you're using for these responses, red flag, anti-pattern, we need to get that in there. Finally, uh, let's talk about the data. Let's bring it back to the data when we think about anti-patterns. All stakeholders within your organization need to be able to articulate what data is going into your models and generally how you're using those models. If you have leadership, if you have developers, if you have anyone important within your organization that can't tell you what's going on or very easily find out what's going on, that is absolutely an anti-pattern. So that's a high level look at trust. Um, but trust is only the beginning. Next, you need to make this trust, you need to make AI easy for your stakeholders to use. And I'm going to turn it over to Nevia to tell us more. Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. When we think about easy, we want to think about solutions delivered fast for your stakeholders. And as you're thinking about easy, you want to be intentional about the solutions you deliver, not just delivering business value immediately, but think about the impact over time for your customers. You also want to think about automated solutions. So you want to get that business to be able to work quickly and also think about scale. So not just now, but how you evolve the business. And also think about engaging solutions. Take the opportunity to delight your users because you want them to be able to adopt the solution that you've created for them. So as we think about easy, let's look at some patterns to consider for your users. In your business, think about AI models, do your due diligence, and then pick a model that's approved for business use. AI models can do a variety of things, so make sure, because your AI model could be used to automate tasks. It could be used to analyze your data. Make sure that the reason or purpose for that AI model is intendedly clear for your users, and make sure it's identified. So that's in your business. But in your org, the very first time your users or stakeholders engage with your AI, you want to make sure that they see the, the disclaimer, that it's clear and readable. The screen has gone away. Um, for your users to be able to handle. So that they know the risks involved, you want to take the opportunity to empower them so that they understand the work that they need to do, so that they're not just trusting what becomes available, but they're also reviewing it and making sure they understand their role with that AI. So next, when they get the slide up, you'll see I'll move to the anti-patterns. The anti-patterns are quite the opposite. So you want to make sure when that data is available for your users, they understand the source of that data. So as you get the information back, you don't want to just be able to trust it. Hold on, let me get you to where I am. Oh, no, I need to go back. Thank you, yes. So you don't want your team to select models that are ad hoc for all the reasons that we've talked about. AI can do a variety of things. There are a bunch of different models available to you. You don't want everybody just picking the thing that worked for them in the moment that feels right because you need them to do the things that's right for the business. And then as we talked about, make sure that the disclaimers are there. If not, then they may not understand the risk involved. They might trust that data and not be looking out for the hallucinations uh, that are uh, inherent in some AI uh, responses. Also, make sure, as I talked about it, that you identify the sources that are available in that generative AI so you understand where that data is coming from. And as the human in the loop, 
You want to empower them to be able to do the work that they need to do to understand the data. So the best example that you've probably all seen, you will have your AI generate an email for you. Imagine if that email just automatically went out and it wasn't in the right tone. It, it had some words that didn't belong in there. So you want to make sure that the folks on your team that, that you're designing for are clear about their involved in, involvement and what they need to do. So with that, we're going to go ahead and look at Adaptable and the solutions that's available for you there. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Nivia. Uh, hello, TDX. Hello, Salesforce Plus Broadcast. Uh, just want to call that out really quick. My first time speaking, so I want to say hello to everybody. So I want to talk about Adaptable. And so an Adaptable, you know, Adaptable solutions evolve with the business, right? When you really look at a core Adaptable solution, the resilient solutions that handle change well, and they're composable solutions that adjust quickly to that change, right? It's both resilient and composable. Now, adaptable, now trusted and easy are important, they're actually higher rank, but the reason for me adaptable is so critical is because AI is rife with risk. There's so much risk around it, right? We talk, like, that's why trusted is a key part of what we do, right? And intentionality is a key part of what we do, but you have to be adaptable when it comes to AI. So, some of the patterns that you want to consider when we talk about AI, so one of the first ones is in your design standards, right? AI is like any other service that you're going to use inside of your Salesforce environment or in your business. So, and it can do quite a few things, right? You look out there, you see a tremendous amount of demos. One of the things to keep in mind is often the LLMs and the gateways, it'll be a single one. It'll be a single one inside of your org, inside of your environment that's accommodating all of this. So you want to ensure that you're designing for that stateless kind of AI, so that it could be used across a variety of use cases. And then when you're monitoring and alerting, like, remember, like, AI can go really wrong really fast. It's all over the news, right? Something horrible happens and, you know, did you know that it was happening? Are you proactive in that response? So being able to have that entry criteria of like, before that prompt is being created in that direct feedback loop, and then what's happening in that indirect feedback loop, you kind of understand it and you see it happen, right? And then in your business process, this is all about the human in the loop, right? We talked about the human in the loop quite a bit here, right? And in the end, you want to ensure that in that feedback loop, right? We talked about direct, you know, direct and indirect feedback loop. Really what it's all about is ensuring that a human being, a person, is evaluating the prompts being generated and providing some reasonable assurance that before these go out to your customers, they're okay, right? So it's really critical that that happens. Like, why is that a testing strategy? Right? The reason it's testing strategies, if you're going to release AI and you're going to test it, you want to make sure what you're testing and release really works well for those humans, and those humans will be the ones hopefully testing it. Don't have AI test your AI. Whoever thinks that's going to be a creative, great way to save on cost, like, don't do it on our platform, go do it on other ones. Right? So these are some of the patterns. Right? Now, let's talk about some of the anti-patterns that are there. So, I'm sure all of your organizations have incredible, amazing ways of monitoring inc incidents in your organization, right? As soon as something bad happens, you know it like that. I'm going to assume that. But the purpose of this anti-pattern is to really execute of like, when you recover as well, you should have the same form of automation. It's not simply knowing that something bad happened, but as it takes longer and longer to respond and recover to that bad thing happening, trust starts to get dissolved. So you want to ensure that in your continuity planning, you are automated throughout the entire process so that you can preserve and maintain trust, right? And then in your KPIs, right? It's not simply a matter of like, all right, we're doing prompt engineering, we're creating all of these, like, you know, setting up all these LLMs. You want to understand what quality looks like. Who should dictate quality? Is it Salesforce? No, it's your organization. You need to dictate what a quality response from the prompt needs to be, because in the end, they're your customers. So you want to make sure that that's there. So what does quality threshold look like? So that's why we talk about its KPIs. Is it achieving this kind of click-through rate you want to see through in indirect feedback loop? Is it achieving what you need to do from the direct feedback loop? You want to make sure that your KPIs and your thresholds are at that level, because the feedback loop is continuous, and you want to make sure that when you go from gate to gate, it's meeting those metrics. And the final one is around the business process, right? Now this is probably the most clear one. Let's say AI goes really wrong really fast. Does everybody here, or even the broadcast, know at your organization who's going to pl unplug the plug before all of a sudden your chatbot is advocating for crazy, or the emails are going from very compliant to not so compliant, and your customers are telling you, hey, um, one of my coworkers saw a lot of my data on an email that they got, How, why, why did that happen? So 
you really want to understand in that time to recover who is responsible for what. If you need to unplug the LLM from the gateway, if you need to switch LLMs, I'm sure everybody knows that you can do that, but you, you switch LLMs, you know, what do you have to do to do that, right? So it's all about how do you respond to those, some of those incidents, right? So that's what's key about that one. That's why we picked that one as the last one because if you don't have names on how to really respond to that AI, you should be really careful about what you put out in front of your customers. All right, we talked a lot about patterns and anti-patterns. We talked a lot about trust, easy, adaptable. But where can you get all this goodness, right? You can find it on the pattern and anti-pattern explorer. On where? Architect.salesforce.com. And what you're going to see here is a QR code. Now the QR code actually goes to a filtered list of all the patterns and anti-patterns related to AI, right? So I know a lot of folks take photos of the patterns and anti-patterns and saw through it, but every single thing that you saw in this presentation is right up there. So I'm going to give folks a little bit of time, even the folks in the broadcast, a little bit of time to get your phones out, do it. Everybody good? All right. Given that, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Hope you had a great event, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you.